Kia ora I see that it's um, midday, so let's make a start. Uh, welcome everybody to this inaugural masterclass in um, public health hosted by the University of Otago in, um, in Aotearoa. Um, let us start with a karakia and please join in if, you, if you're familiar with it. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai, e hiaki ana te atakura, he tio, he hoka, he hauhu, ti he mauri ora. So thank you all very much for joining us today. We've got three marvellous speakers who you can see here on the uh, on the screen, uh, Professor Sue Kringle and Drs John Kerr and Helen Fitt. Uh, one of the... Um, uh, one of the uh, one from each of our campuses in Wellington, Christchurch, and Dunedin. Um, so they're all doing outstanding research in diverse areas of public health. And today we organised this masterclass to uh, uh, to inspire you, really, to um, uh, inspire you to think about public health, to think about uh, working, studying, and and doing research in this area, but also to uh, update those of you already working in the field uh, about some of the key issues that are before us at the moment. Um, we're really delighted to have uh, over 100, in fact, 168 at last count people join us today. And so um, what, why that's really wonderful on the one hand, it does mean that the chances that we'll be able to, able to answer your particular question are, are pretty um, slim. However, we would really welcome you to comment in the chat uh, and um, the um, uh, speakers will give you their email addresses if there are particular issues that you need to um, follow up with them. Um, and I'll try, if I can, to capture some of the key themes and questions to the key speakers as we go. So um, we're here to one, and I'd just like then to introduce our first speaker, who is Professor Sue Kringle. Uh, she's a leading Māori health researcher in the Naitahu Research Unit uh, in our Dunedin campus, and her research focuses on inequities and health services. Uh, and today she's going to talk to us about Te Ora Pū Kahu uh, which is the Māori lung, the lung Screening Programme, and um, speak on her reflections of work in this area. So thanks very much, Sue. The floor is yours. Oh, tēnā koe, Luis. He mihinui ki a koe te kai whakahaere o tēnā e hui, tēnā koe. Huri noa ki a koutou katoa, ko tai mai i roto i te kaupapa o te rā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, so I'll just get my presentation up. Um, and so I'm really pleased to be talking to you today about Te Oranga Pū Kahu Kahu, which is a programme of lung cancer screening uh, research that I'm doing in partnership with um, some people from across the country, actually, but it's particularly with uh, people who are working in what were Te Whatawara Waitamata and um, Auckland DHBs and now the Northern Region. So why do we need lung cancer screening? Uh, well, lung cancer is the leading cause of death for Māori women. Uh, it's the second leading cause of death for Māori men and for non-Māori um, males and females. Um, it's the leading cause of cancer deaths for both Māori and non-Māori. And the Māori mortality rate for men and women is over three times that of non-Māori. Unsurprisingly, the incidence rate um, is also higher for Māori and it's over three times that of the non-Māori peers for both males and females. Lung cancer is the second largest contributor to the life expectancy gap, so the difference in life expectancy for Māori and non-Māori, non-Pacific peoples. And for men, lung cancer contributes about 0.8 of a year and, and um, 0.8 of a year into the 7.2 year difference. And for women, it contributes 1.1 year of a 6.7 year gap. So it's a substantial contributor. Cardiovascular disease is the, um, the first, the largest contributor to that gap. 
five-year survival from lung cancer is less than 20 percent um and which means that you know of all the people diagnosed with lung cancer less than 20 percent of them survived five years and Māori five-year survival is lower than non-Māori, non-Pacific people's five-year survival. There are regional differences in five-year survival as well. Uh, and the region with the lowest five-year survival for Māori and for um, Pacific and for European or non-Māori, non-Pacific people um, is the central um, district. Um, and for Māori, that five-year survival is um, about 8%. So big problem. It's a big problem. Uh, and um, and of course, we need to do everything from tobacco control um, to identifying people with symptoms of lung cancer early and getting them diagnosed and treated um, to improving the inequities in lung cancer diagnosis and treatment that we know exist. Uh, but also we need to look at doing lung cancer screening and lung cancer screening identifies people before they get symptoms of lung cancer uh, and then um, so that they can be diagnosed early and uh, treated at a time when or a stage when treatment cure is possible. It's um, a two-stage process. So first of all, we want to identify asymptomatic people who are at high risk of lung cancer. And they're current in New Zealand, in our context, that's largely people who are current or ex-smokers. And we don't screen everyone who's ever smoked because the balance of harms and benefits means that we don't want to screen people who are at low risk of lung cancer. Uh, so we have a way of identifying people who are at high risk and we do this thing called a risk assessment to do that. We use a risk assessment model called the PLCO M2012, uh, which is um, a, a risk prediction tool that we use. People who meet the risk threshold are invited to undergo shared decision making so that they can decide if having a CT scan is the right thing for them. And then if they choose to, they go on to have a low-dose CT scan. Um, if people have a negative scan, scan, then if we had a national program, then they would go on to get another scan at a suitable, at the suitable or the interval chosen by the national program, likely, I think, to be two years. Um, if people have a positive scan, and what that means is that we see either um, a, a mass or a lesion on the CT scan that looks very suspicious for lung cancer, or we see that lung nodules, then they will go on to either have immediate investigation if it's a very suspicious lesion or what we consider a high-risk nodule. And we have a way of um, um, uh, um, categorizing the nodules from... Uh, very low through to high risk. Um, and so if someone has a suspicious mass or a high risk nodule, they get immediate investigation. Um, and if someone has a moderate risk nodule, they have a, sex, a repeat CT scan in three months and a mild risk nodule, they have a repeat CT scan in 12 months time. And then of course, if people are diagnosed with lung cancer, they go on to have um, the, the treatments in the health system. Um, multiple international studies have shown that um, using low-dose CT scans um, is, uh, uh, is very effective at reducing lung cancer mortality, and that's between 20 to 26% reduction in lung cancer mortality, and it can up, it be up to 39% in women. So the two major trials that have been done have been done in the US, the NLST, uh, saw a 20% reduction in mortality. And in Nelson, which was done in Netherlands and Belgium, there was a 26% reduction in, in mortality. And the, the, we achieved that reduction because we shift the stage at diagnosis. So at the moment, the majority of people who are diagnosed with lung cancer are diagnosed at a late stage, stage three or stage four. Stage four is when lung cancer has spread throughout your body. Um, and it's too late for cure at that point. With screening, then the vast majority of people, and in Manchester, it was like 75%, and that's similar to um, the other programs, 
um, but 75% of people are diagnosed at stage one. Stage one is when the cancer is extremely small and is fully contained in the lung and um, cure is, um, uh, is possible. So our work, um, our focus of our program is to make sure that when lung cancer screening is inter introduced as a national program in Aotearoa, it will be equitable. None of the other national, lung ca uh, national cancer screening programs are equitable at the moment. If we do not have lung cancer screening introduced in an equitable manner, we will make, make those existing terrible mortality inequities worse. And we do not want that to happen. So we are designing, we're doing a variety of research where we want to design lung cancer screening so that it works for Māori. Uh, we do this through a number of mechanisms. So we've got quite, um, we've got a strong um, structure for the program. We've got, um, you know, myself, um, leading the program, we've got a project steering committee, and all but three of the people on this project steering committee are Māori. They consist of public health physicians, respiratory physicians, health service managers, um, academics, public health physicians, community and community representatives, and an on oncologist. Uh, we've got a technical advisory group. Uh, where some members are Māori and that, that consists of respiratory physicians, radiologists, oncologists and um, genetic uh, and biomarker expertise, uh, as you would expect, all the people that you need for a lung cancer screening program. Um, our primary care advisory group is primary care. And um, we have a Taha Kotahi, which is a consumer advisory group. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, of course, we've got some international collaborations in Australia, the UK and Canada, and academic linkages here in Aotearoa. We've got a diverse study team. So I think five of our, five or six of our team members are Māori, um, and the other study team members are absolutely 100% committed to hawara Māori and to equity and to be culturally safe. Um, so we're a program of research. We started in 2018 and we um, repeated, we did a cost effectiveness analysis and demonstrated that um, uh, lung cancer screening was likely to be highly cost effective um, in New Zealand, especially for Māori women, but actually for Māori and uh, males and for non-Māori males and females. Uh, we did some focus groups and survey work with Māori who would be eligible for lung cancer screening and their whānau. Um, to explore their thoughts about lung cancer screening, what would be barriers and um, facilitators of participation in lung cancer screening, what they thought about the use of biomarkers, whole range of things. Um, and as part of that, we established Te Ha Kotahi. Um, and these, so when we did our focus groups, people were amazingly supportive of it once they realized, once they understood what lung cancer screening was. And some people wanted to continue to support our work and we established our um, community or whānau advisory group. And they're still with us to this day. They have a really important role. They help us identify our research questions. They um, give us feedback on design of what we're doing and are really important in um, helping us develop all our st um, study materials, our promotional materials, videos, those kinds of things. Uh, and they're, you know, um, an extremely important part of our work. We've currently got three studies going, and I'm going to talk just about the invitation study today. So in our um, survey work, we said, how would you like to be um, invited to lung cancer screening? And a third of people said by a GP, a third said by a central hub, like breast screening or bowel screening, and a third didn't really care. They just kind of wanted an invite. And so we're testing GP versus our central hub invitation process to see if one, one is more effective than the other. Our hypothesis is that primary care-based screening will be more effective than a central hub. Uh, we're kind of aiming to conduct 512 CT scans. It's funded by the Global Alliance for Chronic Disease and the Health Research Council of New Zealand, for which we are very grateful. 
And we're also collecting information about um, the acceptability of study processes, the feasibility of collecting biomarkers, blood for biomarkers, um, and also all of that kind of information you need to set up a national screening program, like what proportion of people you think are eligible are actually eligible, what proportion agree to go ahead and get a scan, how many positive scans do you have, how many cases of cancer do you diagnose, all of those types of information that you need for a national screening program set up. Our current status as of the 13th of October, um, and I've just got three more slides, I think. Um, so we've recruited all our practices. We have identified just over 1,900 potentially eligible people. Of those, 19% declined to participate. 21% were uncontactable. And 12% uh, were excluded because they didn't meet the criteria. So we were left with 954 participants. Of those who had been, 94% um, um, had completed the risk assessment. The other 6% um, were still in that process. And 53% of those people met the risk threshold. Um, of the 477 people um, who underwent, who were eligible uh, for a CT scan, 93% went through shared decision-making and agreed to have a scan. So we're very, very happy with that. Um, of the 433 scans that had been done, 64% had no significant nodules. 9% um, had a suspicious mass or a very high risk nodule and went straight to investigation. 10% were uh, scheduled for a three month CT scan repeat and 23% were scheduled for a 12-month CT scan repeat. As of the 31st of October, we had diagnosed nine people with lung cancer. Um, I'm going to skip this slide and just go to the lessons. So kind of lessons for me, uh, we often hear about Māori reluctance to participate in um, research, but my experience is that if the research topic of something that's, that is of high priority then Māori will participate, absolutely will participate. Māori participation at all levels of the program is really important, and particularly um, Te Hākotahi and our whānau community, um, Ārōpū. Um, and um, the importance of a DHB or Te Whatawara and um, university partnership, um, you know, it's just so... Um, it's just, it's such a great project and that's in part because great team and it's really important for academics to be working with the sector um, so that we can get on and move quickly to implementation. Um, and um, we already have a national planning process for lung cancer screening underway. It's probably kind of like a three to five year time frame once we get the planning done and the budget bid done and Treasury to agree to fund lung cancer screening. Kia ora. Mm. Kia ora Sue. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation and for that incredible mahi that you and your team are doing. Um, there are some really exciting opportunities um, going to uh, emerge in, in our um, the next few years in our lifetimes. Uh, in this area of cancer screening and prevention, I don't have any questions at the moment in the in the chat. So, um, if anybody does have some for Sue, I'm not sure whether you're able to stay until one, Sue. Yes, yeah, she is. So, if people do have questions for Sue or comments, um, please pop them in the chat. Um, so, moving on, then I'd just like to introduce uh, John Kerr, who is a um, a, a researcher here in Wellington in the Wellington office, and he. Uh, is um, a senior research fellow uh, in and science lead in the Public Health Communication Centre. And he's going to talk to us today about misinformation in public health. Thanks very much, John. Kia ora koutou, everyone. Um, yes, my name is John Kerr, and I'm based uh, in the Department of Public Health at the University of Otago, Wellington. And I work uh, as part of an organisation called the Public Health Communication Centre. Um, and today I've been asked to talk about, about misinformation in public health, um, which is an area of research interest for me. But given the short amount of time, I'm just going to try and cover a few key points. So we're going to skim, a, we're going to skim across the surface a little bit 
but I, I do hope there's a chance for questions at the end. Um, so to start with, I, I just as a an overview, really. Oh, hold on. There we go. What, what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about how we talk about and define um, misinformation, and then some of the negative impacts we see from from mis misinformation in public health. And then briefly talk about some of the potential solutions uh, and some work that's going on in New Zealand. So uh, you may feel like you're hearing more about misinformation than you used to. And if you are, then you're right. Uh, so we've seen an increasing trend. And this is just the number of news articles in New Zealand that mention the word misinformation. Um, and you can probably spot a peak there that the, 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 the number of articles really peaked around the end of 2021 and the start of 2022 which coincides with the COVID-19 vaccine rollout and uh, protests around the vaccine mandates. So right away, you can see that this idea of misinformation is really linked with public health interventions. But there's a challenging question here, which is what are we really talking about when we talk about misinformation? Um, and I always like to highlight this sentence from a recent review, which to me is a real understatement. So it's, it's very easy to say misinformation is false information, but that doesn't quite cut it as a definition. There, there's more difficulty around it than that. Um, this here is a very commonly used definition. It's not the only one, but I'll give you a moment to read it. The, the, a form of this definition is what's used by the New Zealand government. And you can see there's a distinction here between what they term misinformation and disinformation based on the intent of the person sharing it. And that can be useful sometimes, but at other times it's very difficult to actually know what someone was thinking when they created or shared some information. And so it's one of the challenges, just one of the challenges around defining what, what it is we're talking about. For the rest of the talk, I'm just going to use the word misinformation as, as a general term but I wanted to raise awareness around the, the differing definitions. And even amongst experts who study this, there is a lot of argument around how we define these terms. Um, it's very easy to try and say, well, misinformation is false information, but I'll, I'll use a couple of examples to illustrate why that can be tricky. Um, on the left here, this story from David Icke, a well-known conspiracy theorist. Um, this is something that's pretty clearly false. It just doesn't stand up to scrutiny. There's no solid evidence to back it up. We can point at that and say that's misinformation. We know that's not true. Where it gets harder is around news stories or social media posts that share information that is actually technically true, but can be misleading. And I've, I've highlighted this example here, which talks about um, the number of COVID deaths in the US and that the majority of vaccinated people. Now, if you didn't think about that headline very much, you would actually come to a possibly conclusion that that the vaccine puts you at greater risk of death. And that's not the case. Um, it's it's more to do with the number of vaccinated people in the population and also who's getting vaccinated. So older people who are at generally more risk of dying from COVID, even if vaccinated, than younger people. If most older people are vaccinated, then um, you might expect to start seeing so it's the, the number of deaths of vaccinated people increasing. It's a difficult one to explain. But my point is that this story is technically 100% true but can be quite misleading. It's omitted certain information and it's framed in a way to, to cast a negative light on the vaccine. And that's why it gets challenging uh, when you're trying to say, well, this is true and that's false. There are things that can also be misleading. And that's just one example of the challenges. I've, I've highlighted here in these circles a number of other different considerations that people have tried to uh, use when defining misinformation, just as examples to show this sort of nebulous cloud that we're trying to talk about. Um, and what I would say is that in a lot of cases, um, this isn't so important. It is important when you're trying to make a law or create regulations, you actually do need hard and fast rules. But my general advice is to think about misinformation more as landing somewhere on a spectrum for most purposes. Um, I, I think that's a better way to think about it, particularly in public health, um, where there can be misleading information that sits in this middle space. So it's a useful way, rather than trying to fit everything into boxes, we can think about it more as a spectrum. Um, so there's a question of, you know, how bad is it in New Zealand? Unfortunately, no one is tracking all the misinformation uh, available in Aotearoa, but we can look at surveys to get an idea of how many people feel like they're being exposed to misinformation. 
So this was a study, uh, a report from NetSafe earlier this year, and they found that basically everybody feels like they're seeing misinformation. So 91% of New Zealanders said they'd seen misinformation in the last month, and about half feel like they're seeing it daily. Now, there's a challenge here in, in how misinformation is defined and what people infer is misinformation, but it does highlight that people are kind of aware that it's in their media diet and if, at its high levels. Uh, another point is that people are quite worried about misinformation. So 82% are concerned about it. This is a, another survey that's a slightly older, but it had, had a great question in it here, which was, do you think that misinformation is influencing people's views about public health? And nine out of 10 New Zealanders said yes. And again, that underscores the idea that misinformation is a real challenge for public health, that it's something relevant to public health. I'm just going to talk briefly about why um, we should be worried about um, misinformation and some of the examples of the negative impacts it can have. And I'm going to talk about this at a range of different levels, um, starting with just at, at the individual level, so about individual health choices. And people given bad information can make bad choices about their own health. This example here is of someone who drank a, a bleach-based solution as a intended cure for COVID-19. Uh, it didn't work, and it made them quite unwell. Uh, but this person didn't spontaneously decide to do this. They had received some information, and on the basis of that information, they had made a, a choice about what to do about their health, and it was not a good choice. People also make choices about their own health that can also affect others. Um, and I've highlighted perhaps the most obvious example uh, or issue that comes up with misinformation, which is the COVID-19 vaccine. So we know from randomized controlled experiments that people who read typical misinformation around the vaccine uh, are less likely to, to say they're gonna get vaccinated. So we know it has an impact on people's intentions uh, and that can lead to them making uh, choices that leave them more exposed to the virus, but it also means that they may be uh, more likely to transmit the virus to others. So we hear a lot of discussion around ideas like herd immunity and the idea that when you're vaccinated, you're less likely to pass on the virus to someone else as well. So this example where someone's individual choices are starting to impact those around them. Misinformation can also impact people who make choices on behalf of others. So at a sort of policy level, you might see misinformation impacting public health. And just to show you that it's not all about COVID-19, I've used an example from um, about 10 years ago where Hamilton City Council voted to remove fluoride from their water. So fluoride is added to the water as a public health intervention. It reduces the incidence of dental decay. Um, but in this case, Hamilton City Council held a number of public hearings. They listened to a lot of different people. Um, and it turns out they listened to a lot of people who were sharing false and, and unreliable information. And that played a role in their choice to vote to remove fluoride from the water. Um, and reflecting on that, one of the public health professionals in the area had this to say, they, they really pointed out misinformation as playing a key role in that decision-making process. And then if we sort of scale this up to, to sort of a national level, we can think about misinformation having a pact, an impact on how we function as a society, right? So it can drive wedges between people. Um, it can, and, and indeed some foreign powers deliberately try to stoke that div the division with misinformation. Um, and it leads to things like a lack of trust in the medical system, a lack of trust in the government, which all undermine sort of the basic bedrock of what we would need for a, a, a solid public health um, structure in New Zealand. So that's um, a few of just examples of the kinds of negative impact that can happen at different scales. Um, so I'm gonna take a quick breather here and just recap what I've covered. So we know that it's very difficult to define misinformation, but we can think about it broadly as false or mis misleading information. And it's useful to think about it more as a spectrum in many cases. We know that people feel like they're seeing lots of it in New Zealand, and we know that they're worried about it. And we know that it can have a range of negative impacts, both for the individual, but also wider society. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the proposed solutions. Um, it's a complex area, so I'm just gonna to touch on a few key ideas. Um, but to start off with, you can sort of lump these, or at least I've decided to lump these into two categories. One that's more focused on people and improving people's resilience to misinformation, and another that's focused more on the sources of misinformation. So, so online platforms and, and ways that we might limit 
how much misinformation is provided for, on those. So starting with the first step, we, we see things like fact checking. Um, this stuff, uh, the, the whole truth series is a, a fact checking series run by stuff. I think it's very good um, and it's, it's, it's very useful to have that, but it's not sufficient in itself. Um, fact checking takes time uh, and not everybody who reads the fact check sort of report or article, uh, um, not everyone who's seen the original misinformation is going to see the fact check. So it's very difficult to scale up. Um, we've also seen people in New Zealand calling for more education in schools. So um, making media literacy or digital literacy part of the curriculum. And they'll often point to Finland as an example of a country that's done this really well. So um, there, there is pressure to, to sort of focus in the education space when addressing misinformation. But that does mean that you're just limiting it to young people. And there are a whole lot of people who've already been through school who are also being exposed to misinformation. So there are a number of initiatives that try to try upskill people or, or provide resources that can give people more resilience to misinformation. They get better at spotting it. They're less likely to fall for certain claims. And I've highlighted an example here from my colleagues in the UK, um, which was a series of games that are sort of designed to, to teach you some of the hallmarks of misinformation. And I particularly like these ones because one, they've been empirically tested, but two, they actually, they're very scalable. They're things that you can get out to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, and hopefully have some impact. On the other side of the coin, there is things that we should be doing on the platform side. So I'm, I'm talking largely about social media platforms here, um, where a lot of the focus has been. So, you know, there is a list I've shown here of, of different ways that these platforms can try to limit the impact of misinformation from, from outright removing it or banning people to changes in how their systems promote different kinds of information. And to some extent, all the major platforms have been doing um, at least some of these but it varies and it's entirely on a sort of voluntary basis, at least in New Zealand. Um, however, there's work currently underway that is trying to develop a framework for regulating online content. It's early days uh, at the moment. So the Department of Internal Affairs here in New Zealand has held a consultation on the first steps towards developing a regulatory framework. They've um, listened to a lot of people. They're due to report back in December, so next month. And we should hear more about um, at least the information that's come in from that process and ideally what the next steps are in sort of coming up with ways to regulate online platforms. There's also a group that's been convened by the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, which draws together a number of experts and people from civil society to work together to try and chart a course um, of how New Zealand is going to respond to mis and disinformation. And I imagine they'll be looking through a lot of the things I've just briefly covered in this talk. And they are also due to report back in December. So it's a case of watch this space um, in terms of finding out what the next steps are for New Zealand in this process. There's just one other thing I'd like to add, um, which I haven't really talked about, which is not misinformation, but the idea of putting good information out there and having uh, what we'd call a, a healthy information landscape. And that's where my work at the Public Health Communication Centre comes in. Uh, we, among other things, run a website where public health researchers and practitioners write commentary and analysis on um, breaking news, government policy, and a range of other issues with a focus on making it more accessible to the public and policymakers and, and trying to make clear some of the key points. Um, so I've highlighted a few examples here. Uh, if you're interested, go and have a look at our website, phcc.org.nz. Um, and if you want to stay up to date, you can hit the big orange subscribe button at the top. That's my plug for the, the Public Health Communication Centre. I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to stop there and just say um, thank you for your attention and time. Kia ora, John. Thanks very much again for an extremely elucidating um uh, commentary from you. Uh, there are uh, lots of applause coming through and thumbs up. And uh, I see that uh, there's a few questions in the the uh, Q and A. And Sue has been very kindly replying to ones related to her. So maybe John, you might like to have a quick look and see if there's something there that you could respond to directly. Um, I'd like now to move on to um, 
uh, welcoming um, Helen Fitt, who is a public health lecturer at our Christchurch campus. And she is a researcher in transport, and I should say, and also sustainable transport. And today she's going to talk about the EV at the top of the cliff. Thanks very much, Helen. Thank you, John. Can I just ask you to stop your screen sharing so that I can? Thank you. Yorikoto, <clears throat> in 1895, Joseph Marlins wrote a poem <clears throat> describing the debate that a population was having about whether to build a fence at the top of a cliff to stop people falling off or whether to provide an ambulance at the bottom. The ambulance won out largely because some of the, uh, the characters in the poem argued that falling off a cliff doesn't actually do anybody any harm. It's the stopping at the bottom, which is problematic, and therefore it's at the bottom that we need to intervene. Now, this story has become something of a parable of public health, and many of us would argue that actually preventing harms before they happen is easier, it's cheaper, it's more effective, and it's undeniably less unpleasant than preventing harm after it's taken place. Today, what I want to do is talk about some of the harms that are that come about through our current and future transport systems. And I want to do that because if we're thinking about building some of those metaphorical fences to prevent harm before it happens, we need to understand what harm it is that we're actually trying to, pre um, to prevent. So I want to start with harms from current transport, and particularly when we're talking about cliffs and fences, then perhaps the most obvious thing that springs to mind is the road toll. Now, I'm very happy to report that the occupants of this car did both survive, but we probably all are aware of the fact that in New Zealand, between three and 400 people die every year on New Zealand roads. That I think is, as I say, fairly well known, but perhaps less well known <clears throat> is that we actually also have impacts from local air pollution, which have a higher toll than those from collisions and accidents. In 2016, motor vehicle emissions um, and other pollutants resulted in, nine, in over 9,000 hospitalizations and over 2,000 deaths. Our current transport systems of course, also contribute to climate change, which in turn uh, contributes to impacts on human health through things like volatile weather, um, sea level rise and population displacement. The way we get around can also contribute to congestion, which in turn has uh, it increases the impacts that we feel from uh, pollution. Um, and it also has its own impacts in terms of things like stress and congestion even has measurable impacts on things like family violence. Traffic also can lead to community severance. So roads bisect or cut through human and animal communities with implications there for safety and for community cohesion. And the paving that we use to surface our roads and our car parks can increase uh, flooding risks and can also uh, contribute to biodiversity loss and takes up valuable land which we might use for other useful social purposes were it not for that use. And then we come to sedentary lifestyles. Now this picture is from uh, Wally, -E, the movie, um, and in Wally -E, the, uh, the people get around in robot driven chairs um, everywhere they go having long since lost the ability to stand, to walk or to run. Now Wally -E isn't based on rigorous academic evidence, um, and the real world is a whole lot more complicated than this, having people with all sorts of different physical abilities. But it remains the case that uh, not getting enough exercise in our life can have serious health consequences, and often the way that we get around is a contributor to how much exercise we do or don't get. Inaccessibility and social exclusion can also have uh, serious health consequences. It's often the case that when um, 
a large number of the people in a population use a particular way of getting around. When certain people are unable to use that way of getting around for whatever reason, they can find it difficult to access important amenities like uh, healthcare facilities, workplaces, shops and social venues. And when people are unable to access uh, those amenities, it can lead to social exclusion or to people not being able to participate in society in the way that others might. And in some research that colleagues and I have done with uh, residents in social housing provision, seven out of 10 of our participants told us that transport difficulties or costs meant that at least occasionally they couldn't visit a doctor, they couldn't go grocery shopping, and they couldn't meet friends or relatives. And each of these things has serious health consequences associated with it. Social uh, exclusion on its own has been described as having similar health effects as smoking. So people who are experiencing even just that social uh, exclusion aspect um, can be facing serious health consequences. And finally, in our catalogue here of impacts of uh, transport, we have urban sprawl. Now, our, the size and shape of our urban areas is inherently linked to the way that we get around. So when most people walk, we locate our amenities in dense, compact, walkable urban centres. When people get around primarily using public transport, we start to locate our amenities more in corridor type patterns. And when people get around using personal vehicles, we're more likely to locate our amenities in more distributed patterns. And that can help generate urban sprawl. And urban sprawl itself is often considered to be a bad thing because it exacerbates all of the things that we've talked about so far, but it also makes it much more uh, difficult and more expensive to provide things for the population. So things like uh, three waters provision and collection of rubbish become difficult when urban areas expand. So what we can see here is that transport and health impacts are intricately connected in many different ways. And this has been a very quick overview of some of these, but I want to start thinking now about where that leads us to uh, in future. And I want to start doing that by looking at some of the changes that we can expect to see in future transport. And I want to do that because when we look at the world around us like this, it can often seem that many of these problems are intractable. Uh, things are the way they are, and it's remarkably difficult to change them. But if we look at transport history and learn the lessons of transport history, we can see that things can change very, very quickly indeed. So, for example, if you were a child in the early 1800s, it's, uh, it's quite likely that if you wanted to go to a neighboring town or village, you would have been walking or using some kind of horsepower to transport to get there. But by the end of your lifetime, it's entirely plausible that you would have traveled by steam train, by electric train, by electric car, by combustion, petrol or diesel car, and also by bicycle. So in the space of a single human lifetime, we saw our transport system undergo remarkable change. Now, this was quite an unusual period in our transport history. But that said, things are changing all the time. And if we take a proactive uh, approach to what our future transport looks like, then there's good potential that we might be able to mitigate some of the, uh, the less good effects of our transport systems while also benefiting from the positive ones. So if we come back then to our future transport, what does future transport have in store for us? Well, let's start with electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are already making up um, inc an increasing size of our vehicle fleet. And they're often argued to be good primarily from uh, the point of view of climate change. And cl climate change is absolutely very important. But when we consider electric vehicles, we also have to consider the other impacts that they might have. Less well known than climate change, I think is perhaps the potential that electric vehicles have to change our road top. Now, electric vehicles feel different to drive compared to combustion driven vehicles. They're smoother, they're quieter, and they, uh, they often have much better acceleration, much higher acceleration. And as a consequence of feeling better, feeling different, 
people drive electric vehicles differently. In some research that I did with electric vehicle owners, most of the people I talked to told me that when they drive an EV, they usually drive it more conservatively than a combustion driven car. And part of the reason for that is that driving aggressively depletes the battery more quickly. But many of my participants also told me that they do like to take advantage of the special characteristics of an EV. One of my participants told me, sometimes I drive it like I stole it just because I can. And another one said, on occasion, the urge to bogan overrides better judgment. Now, we don't know yet what the implications of a more general shift to electric vehicles uh, is going to be. But as we consider how to address our road toll in future, the changing, changes in driver behavior are certainly something that we should be paying attention to. It's also worth noting that in terms of pollution, electric vehicles might have less of a benefit than we may expect. While a shift to EVs certainly eliminates tailpipe emissions, much of the particulate matter pollution that comes from uh, vehicle transport actually comes from non-exhaust emissions. So it comes from brake, tire and road wear. So if we're going to shift to EVs and we're concerned about those, those implications of local transport, we need to consider how to reduce and mitigate those emissions of particulate matter. And that might include driving less and including more vegetation in our urban areas. We also know that when uh, people shift to EVs, they often start to drive more. There are a number of reasons for that that I don't have time to go into, but if we drive more, then we have implications for things like congestion, for community severance, for paving, and if we shift to driving instead of, for example, walking to the dairy to buy milk, then also for those sedentary lifestyles. If we move to e-bikes though, e-bikes have many of the advantages of electric cars that make them so popular, including that they're fun, they're a cheap way of getting around, and they come without environmental guilt. So if we look at e-bikes, if we shift from driving cars to riding e-bikes, we potentially reduce some of those pollution and congestion issues, and we increase the exercise that helps to prevent some of those uh, diseases of inactivity. We also potentially locate um, amenities in easily e-bikeable distance, thus minimizing our contribution to urban sprawl and reducing those implications on infrastructure costs. I want to talk very quickly about driverless cars before I finish. Now, driverless cars are on their way and they are widely expected to contribute to urban sprawl if we don't do anything proactive to prevent that. So that's something we need to think about before they really get here. But I want to mostly focus on inaccessibility and social inclusion. And we often see claims that driverless cars will help people, particularly with disabilities and older people, to get around in the way that everybody else does, and so will improve equity of transport. But I think it's important to note that that claim is based on a couple of somewhat tenuous assumptions. The first assumption is that everyone will be able to access driverless cars. If everyone's to be able to access driverless cars, we will need uh, the access and booking systems for those to be based on inclusive principles. And I think if we asked many people with disabilities whether that's something we can safely assume will happen automatically, they might tell us it's safe. It's not safe to make that assumption. The other assumption that is made is that technology will be affordable for those who need it most. Now, we know that at the moment, some people struggle to afford getting the bus. Driverless cars are not going to be cheaper than buses unless we intentionally make them so. Which brings us back to the point of this presentation, which is about where a public health approach to transport can be useful. And I think where a public health approach to transport can be really useful is in two areas. First, it can help us to understand the health impacts of transport. And hopefully today I've given a bit of an overview of what those are for current and potentially for future transport. And then a public health approach can help us to plan for healthy future transport systems.
Now, I know that this has been a super quick overview and we've only just scratched the surface here today, but I know that Louise is about to talk about other ways to engage with us in more depth. And colleagues and I would be delighted to hear from anybody who wants to explore that intersection between health and transport in more detail. For now, though, I want to finish by saying I'm quite often asked how transport is part of public health and why I'm particularly interested in transport technology. But I thought I'd let Joseph Marlins answer that question for me with the words of one of his protagonists from his 1895 poem. Come neighbours and friends, let us rally. If the cliff we will fence, we might almost dispense with the ambulance down in the valley. Thank you and back to you, Louise. Uh, kia ora. Thank you very much, Helen. Nice to have some poetry uh, today. Um, would you all join with me in thanking very much Sue, uh, John and Helen for their marvellous presentations this morning and this, uh, this afternoon, in fact. Um, we've had a few questions in the Q&A and um, people have been answering them. So again, if uh, John, Helen and Sue would just go and check. Um, it would be good to have you answer those questions if possible. And Inga was going to just put up some last closing slides for us um, today. Uh, if you've enjoyed or been inspired by uh, what these three wonderful people have been telling you today uh, and would be interested in doing some further study in public health, we've got a range of postgraduate opportunities, both uh, in Christchurch and Wellington, as well as in our home campus in Dunedin. There's a choice of 19 papers, and you can tailor uh, those to your interests and start at a number of stages throughout the year. Uh, we also are very keen to talk to people about the possibility of doing PhDs and uh, have uh, quite a few between us all uh, across the Motu. Uh, and then also, if um, a longer piece of study is not uh, for you, you might want to join us at our next summer school uh, in 2024 in February here in person in Wellington, some also uh, out of Auckland, uh, and a number online as well. We've got 18 short courses this year, so one or two days um, by and large uh, courses for you to upskill in um some of the current issues in, that are very topical and the new information that's available and also um, uh, to do some of those sort of fundamental things like introduction to Hawara Māori, for example, which are critical for all of us in our mahi in Aotearoa. So again, um, I would um, like just to close with a karakia, but before I do so, um, could I um, ask you all to join with me once more in thanking everybody, uh, our three speakers, for um, their wonderful work today. We're early, but it's uh, lunchtime and maybe you can all go and have a quick stroll or see some sunshine, but not in Wellington, I suspect. Uh, I'll just uh, close with the uh, karakia unuhia. So if you do not, please join with me. Unuhia, unuhia, unuhia ki te uru tapanui, ki awatia, ki mama, te nako, te tinana, te wairua, e te ara takata, koia rā e rongo, whakairia ake ki ronga, ki a tina tina, huie tae ki e. Ka kite, everybody. Keep well. Thank you very much for joining us.